All right, thank you for joining us today for our fourth and final webinar in the Emerging Priorities in Education webinar series, The Digital Divide, Lessons Learned from the Pandemic and Long-Term Considerations. My name is Cheryl Crone and I'm Deputy Director of K-12 Education at the Hunt Institute and welcome you to this conversation. Through our project, The COVID Constituency, we have found voters and parents across the country and across party lines have a strong desire to see the digital divide closed so students have broadband access and devices in school and at home. We look forward to learning more from our panelists on how they have worked to address the digital divide. A few quick logistics. First, our panelists look forward to answering questions towards the end of the discussion today, so please put your questions for them in the Q&A feature of Zoom, and we will get to as many questions as possible. Second, follow along on social media using our hashtag COVID constituency. I am excited to introduce our panelists and moderator for this conversation. Joining us today is Superintendent Joan Ebert from the Nevada Department of Public Instruction, Dr. Ruth Akoya, Director of K-12 Initiatives at the Source for Learning, and Ernie Holtry, Project Manager at the Indiana Broadband Office. Moderating today's discussion is John Bailey, a visiting fellow at AEI and strategic advisor at Walton Family Foundation. Thank you all for participating in this important and especially relevant discussion. John, I turn it over to you. Great, well, I mean, amazing to be with you. First of all, thank you to the Hunt Institute for creating this space and creating this moment and bringing together such amazing uh, experts on this area. So uh, it is good to be with you. I will just sort of set the table and then really we'll get into some conversation, really encourage folks to use the hashtag and ask questions and we'll make this as much of a discussion as we can. But um, we, we have this sort of amazing opportunity right now. Um, the COVID obviously has shown a spotlight on so much of the inequities that had existed in education way before COVID ever entered our shores, uh, way before our schools ever closed. Um, but it exacerbated many of those inequities. And one at the forefront of that has been the digital divide. That what we learned is that a student who lacked a computer and lacked sufficient broadband at home meant they lacked access to education. It was the equivalent of taking away a school bus. There was no way for them to get to school, to get to their in, uh, instruction, uh, to get to teachers and to access other types uh, of uh, wraparound supports and other types of services. It really brought into the forefront how important it was to close the homework gap generally, that, that digital divide between schools and homes, but how important it was to close the digital divide uh, as a society. And what we have seen is something I've never seen in uh, all my years and with looking at public policy, which is just an unprecedented amount of funding by Congress to help address this. And we had as part of the American Rescue Plan, $10 billion passed, uh, mostly around the homework gap, but uh, also a little bit around uh, closing uh, the affordability gap with families that lacked the funding to be able to participate uh, in, in, in get uh, broadband benefits for themselves. And then just this week, we had President Biden sign the bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill. It has been a running joke for years in Washington, D.C. that this is infrastructure week. And, uh, and yet we have an infrastructure week where it included $65 billion for broadband and closing the digital divide and making it more affordable. The slide up on your screen, which we'll take down here in a minute, just gives a brief outline of the programs on that. But $42 billion that will be going out in grants to states who then will subgrant those funds down uh, to communities and to schools in many instances as a way of sort of building out connectivity and helping to bridge the digital divide there. We have $14 billion as part of a program called the American Connectivity Program, which is really just renamed from the emergency broadband benefit. And this will provide $30 a month for low-income families, as well as students receiving Pell Grants uh, in order for them uh, to be able to purchase broadband uh, each month. And they get uh, 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 as much as $100 to also purchase a device, a laptop, or a tablet computer. So it's gonna be huge for addressing the affordability gap for many of our low-income families. There's a Digital Equity Act, another set of competitive grants that will go out to help address with training and making public access available, as well as 
Uh, you, you see this terminology used throughout the legislation, community anchor institutions. What is a community anchor institution? In many cases, it's a school. Many it's a it's an institution of higher education. It's a it's a, a public health office, and so these funds are going to be prioritizing our schools, our public health centers, and whatnot. We have two rural plays with uh, uh, the the rural reconnect program and the tribal broadband program. And then there's something called Middle Mile. Middle Mile is like not sexy in education, but it's all this sort of dark fiber and these other types of infrastructure play. How do you get those mobilized and lit? and engage to help sort of connect and also be used to help uh, bridge the digital divide there too. So anyway, unprecedented. This literally just signed into law on Monday. We haven't even seen what these grant applications are gonna be like. And, and it's why uh, today's conversation is gonna be so important for state leaders and local leaders and school leaders to begin thinking about uh, their plans, their needs uh, in order to access and, and leverage these funds. And so, uh, it is so great uh, to be with you. Again, thank you to, um, uh, to Hunt for organizing this. Uh, Ernie, let's start with you. What challenges still remain in Indiana to help close the digital divide? So like what steps, just give us the picture. What, what is the state of the digital divide in Indiana? What steps are you using to, to try to help close those, those divides right now? Sure, thank you, John. Um, mm -hmm. In Indiana, uh, the Indi uh, I'm a project manager for the Indiana Broadband Office, and uh, we're uh, part of the Lieutenant Governor's family of business in Indiana. Uh, we have a sister agency called OCRA. The acronym stands for the Office of Community and Rural Affairs. And just a few weeks ago, OCRA was fortunate enough to bring on a gentleman by the name of uh, Roberto Gallardo. And uh, Roberto works for the Purdue Center of Regional Development. And he came on board uh, through a state contract with Purdue to manage the state's uh, next level connections broadband fund. So we're very excited uh, to work with Roberto and Okra and the Lieutenant Governor's Office and the Governor's Office to accomplish the uh, vision of the Indiana Broadband Office, which is to be the one stop shop uh, for all things broadband in the state of Indiana and then try to bring both um, affordable and reliable connectivity to, to, to our Hoosier residents. Um, one thing that we see in challenges, uh, John, is uh, local leadership capacity. So down at, in that local uh, county commissioner's office or in that mayor or town planner's office, um, what, what do they have as far as uh, technical uh, know-how? Uh, what do they have equipment-wise? What do they have access to uh, equipment-wise? Um, for the, uh, the speeds that are coming into their building, right? So, um, and then the human capital itself. Um, in small communities, uh, one individual puts 16 different hats on, serves on four different committees, uh, uh, plus the school board and, and volunteer work. So how do we uh, train up those local leaders um, that are wearing so many hats to begin with uh, to help with that leadership capacity at the local level? So. Our Indiana Broadband Office works uh, to provide technical support for those individuals. And a lot of that is what you just uh, did uh, for us in the introduction is breaking down all those pots and all those funds and what should be prioritized over what, state over federal, federal over state, public-private partnerships, all those things working together down at the local level. Also encouraging the local uh, level individuals to be proactive in knowing what each other are doing. So the chamber knowing what the foundation is doing, the foundation knowing what the mayor's office is doing, the mayor's office knowing what the county commissioners are doing uh, and, and actively engaging in, in sharing that human capital of resources. Uh, so we can be a conduit there for that. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, working on awareness, um, awareness on why the gaps exist. Is it a connectivity issue um, where the lines actually are not running to the community or to the neighborhood? Is it an uptake issue where the lines go right by the house and only four in 10 houses uh, take, take the service? Uh, providers will tell you over and over again, um, they need that higher uptake percentage to decrease their cost per passing. So how can we work on that adoption and, um, and usage piece of the, of the puzzle? I, I, you laid it out so clearly because th there's access issues. How do you deploy uh, infrastructure out those? There's affordability issues. Uh, and there's planning issues, which you talked about as well. 
Dr. Okuya, I, I just want to turn to you because like building off of these comments, I mean, there are obviously unique equity gaps relating to race, wealth, language, geographic region, ability status, even age when it comes to things like broadband and adoption and technology use. From your research and experience, how has the increase in online platforms for education and work exacerbated equity gaps? And what can we do to address it, which is so fundamental as a key part of the broadband legislation that just passed is that there's funds targeted to closing the equity gap. So talk a little bit about what might work there. Well, so with the work that we do, um, we have teachers come from all over the world um, who come to us and they, throughout this whole pandemic, they've been bringing us consistently two issues. One is, of course, is infrastructure and the other is training. Um, and so when buildings close for whatever reason, we have to be able to rely on internet. And, you know, obviously we're talking about infrastructure, but beyond that, if the teachers don't understand how to use these platforms, if the teachers don't understand how to vet the platforms or how to use them in best practice, then you've got a whole other level in terms of equity issues for that whole equity cake that we're building, you know? Um, and so if you've got students who are there who can, who, who have, you know, whatever it is that they've got in terms of device, um, but they don't have a teacher who knows how to leverage that device, then we have some other kind of equity issue that needs to be addressed. So, um, you know, for example, we had some, some teachers who come to us, two uh, kindergarten teachers that I, I worked with, you know, one who, you know, the people in her district had decided that she needed to teach her kindergarten students for six hours a day via Zoom you know, um, and that was the model that they thought was going to be appropriate. Uh, and then on the other hand, I had another kindergarten teacher who, you know, they decided that they would have very, very little bit of, you know, face to face, but that the teachers would work on giving concentrated video so that the kids could get good instruction and to have a playlist and they would work through the playlist and then the teachers would work with the parents. Very different model. And you can see what kind of differences you would get for the kids who are little. Also, the same kind of thing happens obviously as you scale it up to children who are in other grades. That's great. Uh, so important. Superintendent Ebert, I, I mean, first of all, the fact you're with us is, I can't even imagine how much you're wrestling with right now with schools reopen and with ARP funds, and you just have a lot going on with your schools that you're serving. Um, but I'd love for you to just reflect because I, I think, you know, one of the things that we're hearing and we're seeing in a lot of surveys is that uh, some of this online learning is a genie that you can never get back in the bottle. That uh, even though our schools are reopened and kids are back in the classroom, we're going to be thinking about sort of new ways of, of using technology for kids at home with, with online learning and with doing homework and other activities at home and with blended learning and flipped classroom models. And so I, I'd love for you to just sort of reflect a little bit about the, the work you're leading right now, about learning that's happening outside of the four walls of a classroom. And, uh, and that's going to require, frankly, home connectivity to broadband and devices. So how are you supporting schools, educators, and families to make sure students have what they need to learn outside of the, the school for the years to come here? Thank you, John, and thank you too to the Hunt Institute for having all of us. I mean, already you just going through what was signed in on Monday was very helpful as well as we start to all digest what's going on. Uh, you know, it, it, it has been a whirlwind, but the, the blessing on all of this is that there are components of this work that we as a nation have been, you know, messing with around the edges. Well, March 2020 said, guess what? You can't mess around the edges anymore. You have to move forward. We're going to put you into this environment and you're going to learn how to swim and you're going to learn how to swim really well. Uh, it just like learning how to swim. It's difficult at times. I'm not going to say it's been, you know, 100% easy and, you know, things are going really well here in Nevada. They are going well, but it is difficult work. And so first and foremost, uh, you know, we looked at the three different layers, um, providing uh, resources for our educators and our families during the pedagogical shift. Going from the unit of the four walls, as you said, in a classroom, traditional classroom, going to school on that bus, the classroom is now in some instances, the kid's bedroom, the kid's bed, 
you know, and the parents saying, no, you need to get dressed, even though you're, you're here at, at school today when you get online and, and do that work. So at the State Department, providing those resources, we first put together a guide um, immediately that centered around the shift of digital ped pedagogies. We also brought together the talent that we had within our state. And I reached out to my friends across the nation that have excellent talent as well. But we looked internally and said, who in our state right now knows how to deliver education at a distance, knows how to support our families, knows how, how to find our families, go knocking on each and every single door to find our families, to make sure that they're safe, that they have devices to get in touch with our, their teachers, and then us supporting the teachers. And so we quickly spun up um, a platform statewide. We made sure that we use the first set of CARES, CARES dollars to go into providing those uh, supports for our educators. We knocked on doors to find all of our children, and we continue to build all of that out. For us, I think we still are um, one of the very few states that can say that every single child uh, that was learning at a distance has a device and has connectivity. Now, is it sufficient connectivity? No. That's why I'm really happy about all that money that you explained early on to everyone. But we spun up a public-private partnership right away with the governor's office with the Elaine Wynn P Foundation, with communities and schools, many others to make sure that we could provide um, for all of our students. And I'm really proud that uh, our state has done just that and we continue to move forward. It is, because I, I remember when you issued the press release and, uh, and because we had lots of states launch digital divide efforts, but the fact that you were able to close the divide, I mean, just talk a little bit about like, how you did that, because it, it, first of all, it was just knowing which kids were disconnected and unconnected uh, and maybe underserved, but you had to do some sort of massive amounts of surveying and just trying to understand like student needs and direct resources, the limited resources we had at the time, even with CARES Act. But can you just talk a little bit about the process and how you did that? Sure. Uh, so the public-private partnership was huge. Uh, spinning up first a group of, of talent across the state, not just in education, but also in the industries uh, that understood, you know, uh, uh, all of the components of project management. You know, what are, the, what are the data points that we need? Then I worked with the superintendents, all the superintendents across the state and the state public charter school authority and said, we need to identify every single child in our state by name, by address, by face. Uh, and what we're going to do is actually create a website. So we created a, a Connecting Kids website and we put up the data so that it was transparent. Everyone, you could, you could see it wherever you're at. You know, what, the folks in Washington, D.C. could do it. And every single week, the school districts reported out which child, which children still needed devices and which children still needed to have um, a hotspot. We were part of the T-Mobile um, settlement. Uh, so 18,064 hotspots uh, came into our state. In some instances, we issued those out. They did not work in some areas of our state. And so that we brought them back in and reissued them. Uh, but it was the constant communication of understanding uh, who needed the device, which families, and we have some families that, uh, you know, aren't, their family's not uh, identified as free and reduced lunch, but they went home, they would have three children at home, two parents that all now were using the bandwidth within the home. And so multiple devices were needed and as well as um, additional bandwidth to that house. So yeah. being very clear and transparent on need with your public um, helped us immensely. And then, you know, constant communication about supply chain, uh, where devices were, how we could get them. Um, and it was working at many, many angles. And I would add lastly is having the uh, local, the cities, the municipalities, we pulled on their resources too, to knock on doors. You know, people went around in neighborhoods with devices in their cars. Um, so that if they knocked on a, a door of a family, 
that it wasn't, okay, we'll come back to you in a week from now, but here, let me go to the car. We're gonna issue, a, issue you a device right now um, with connectivity so that you can be supported. And we were not going to stop until we could claim on that website 100%. Um, and that was in, in uh, a year, almost a year ago in January. Wow, amazing. I mean, there's so much to it, I mean, pull out from there. The, the whole community approach, the knocking on doors, we're finding that with the emergency broadband benefit that you just can't reach people through emails because they're not connected. It really does. It takes the same sort of work you do with uh, with signing people up for census. It's knocking on doors and getting getting people to and helping them with signing up for it. So, so much great practice. We'll come back to that. Uh, 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 Ernie, I want to go back to you because like in Indiana, I mean, you had this uh, Indiana broadband office was doing amazing work too to help uh, connect kids and families during uh, the pandemic. Talk a little bit about how you did that. How did you work with the community players, with other state agencies and with schools to get those kids connected? Sure, sure. Uh, one of the first things we did as soon as COVID hit, uh, within a couple weeks of kids being sent home and uh, adults working from home, um, we started convening uh, leadership calls every Tuesday that we called our uh, broadband roundtable calls. And on those calls, uh, we had individuals from other uh, state agencies uh, like our Department of Transportation, um, the Department of Health, uh, Department of Education. And then we invited the association leaders from all of our uh, uh, rural broadband uh, telecoms. And we invited the state leaders of several of the big players. And we invited some local leadership. And every week we convened those Tuesday calls. And we talked about initially things like the, the PPE, who has gloves, who has what they need. Um, we talked about, uh, um, I don't know the exact terminology, but doing each other's work essentially. So if a Verizon care uh, a technician was out on a pole and there was something out, they had a reciprocal agreement with T-Mobile or, or even uh, the local telephone company uh, to, to assist each other in some of those uh, things. So, so we, we found some real engagement in those calls and then coming out of those calls, we're able to maintain those and actually open some lines of communication that had never been opened before that, that we could build on those over the next 15 or 18 months. Uh, secondly, uh, we started working with um, of various uh, state and private partners, and we created a free Wi-Fi, uh, a, a map of uh, free Wi-Fi hotspot locations. So we weren't mapping the Starbucks and the McDonald's that everyone knew about, but we were mapping uh, pro private locations uh, along with the schools and libraries that would have accessibility uh, to broadband in the parking lots. And, and even though it was uh, late winter, early spring, those connectivity points were there for the people to actually drive to if needed uh, to have connectivity uh, as, as we had to react quickly to, to the pandemic as it occurred. And then our office uh, had dozens, if not hundreds of one-on-one -on -one technical assistance calls there again, where we could just simply uh, listen to the concerns and then craft a solution. And many of those solutions were, have you reached out to such and such school district or have you called such and such county? they found a great solution for this. So, so we acted as that conduit of, of information sharing just from one entity to another. That's amazing. I, one, one point you made, which I think is important to emphasize going forward was the mapping. And you know, one of the things that when I was reading the legislation for this infrastructure bill, so many of the programs rest on areas that are um, considered to be underserved or uh, unserved. And there's technical speed definitions that, as well as like number of households and people that sort of like meet those criteria, but it all is gonna rest on data. And what's interesting about this is that, you know, there, there's been some challenges with the federal data at the FCC and over at the Department of Commerce. So the legislation builds in this challenge process that if someone feels like that a designation is, is wrong or that it should be designated as unserved, underserved, there's a process in which that community can actually challenge that determination. And, and uh, NTIA over at the Department of Commerce uh, can actually be the final arbiter in some of this, but it requires mapping and it requires data. And so it's um, incredibly important that you did that. Dr. Coolia, I wanna like, I jumped the gun because I was so excited to dive, in, to dive into the equity work. And I didn't give you the chance to talk about source for learning and kind of the work you're doing there, 
the research you're doing, and also the resources you're making available for states, schools, teachers, and families to think thoughtfully about this. So can you talk a little bit about what is the source for learning? Sure. So the Source for Learning is a nonprofit organization. And what we do is we look to find gaps that we can kind of fill as we, you know, work with teachers and parents and, and students. So when the pandemic really hit and we were hearing from teachers that there was some need for, you know, some support, we did four things really quickly. The first was we added to our um, we do professional development for teachers. And so we added to our lineup a bunch of um, ask me anything kind of sessions so that teachers could come and they could learn about, you know, uh, what were best practices or what kind of tools might they use. And everything that we suggest or, or give to teachers is free so that they then don't have to then think about how do they find funding to do whatever the suggestion is. Uh, so we did that and then we came up with a few jumpstart sheets because we found out that teachers had no idea, you know, if they were going to try this, then what to do. So we put together little packets of, uh, you know, uh, blog posts and things of that nature that we had that we could just say, you know, if you need a place to start, here, you know, uh, so that after they came to the Ask Me Anything, they had some additional resources available so that they could continue to learn and, you know, refine so that they could get better at what they were trying to figure out for their students. Uh, we also uh, did a pre-release of our My Sci Life program. It's a um, science uh, platform where students can uh, socially uh, learn about science and research and then uh, share what they've learned and those kind of things. So it's about engagement and writing in science. And so we wanted to have teachers to have access to that uh, before we had planned to, because it was ready, but we just were going to do it for the school year. But then, you know, we had a need. So we went ahead and, you know, let it happen so that, you know, teachers could use that if they needed to. And then the other thing we did was we ramped up our hotspot program. We do have a small hotspot program that we allow uh, schools to take out uh, hotspots. They borrow them for us so that they could then send those home. And then, you know, because a hotspot can help with about 10 you know, eight to 10 devices so that if you've got a, 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 a parent who's got, you know, the computer and the internet, you know, and you still need other things, these children could then borrow that hotspot and go home and then the three kids or four kids or whoever who needed to be able to in access the internet could have some extra bandwidth as well. Um, and so we did all of those four things really rapidly because we knew that there was a need and that the, there was gaps. And so we're trying to fill the gaps that we could. That's what we did really quick. <laughs> really quick. I know that's, I mean, it makes it amazing. You did that really quick. Like that's the, uh, you see, you make it sound like magic happened because but it took a lot of, a lot of effort and a lot of planning and a lot of work and a lot of persistence. So thank you for that. I, I mean, we'll go to uh, Q and A's from, uh, we have so many people on the webinar today, which is great because so we're, we're going to pull them into the conversation in Q and A. But I want to ask each of you just to do a rapid fire, but just your, your leaders working at this really powerful intersection of technology and education equity in your respective positions and your respective communities. What strategies have you seen that have been the most effective uh, in, in terms of uh, advocating for specific programs and policies that close the digital divide, but also um, other strategies that can actually close the digital divide? What have you seen that, that's most effective? And uh, we'll start with the Superintendent Eber first. Great. Uh, what I would say, a, a few things, not just one, but really quickly, uh, the public-private partnerships, which I mentioned earlier, making sure that now that you have them, or at least for us, that they continue. It, it can't be just a one and done. You know, thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to the next, but to continue that you have those conversations with your partners, they have multiple perspectives that, and, and expertise that they can bring to the table. Um, also, I'd recommend that those of you who are in positions um, of power and find ways, you know, you collaborate, collaborate effectively, that you bring key voices, all of your community voices to the table early and often. Uh, our community members, they're the ones that you're serving. They can be extremely, uh, uh, they're the ones that know what's happening in their homes. They have ideas, they have solutions, they can be a strategic partner. And so bring them into the work, empower them to help you with the work, 
and move forward quickly. The two-way conversation with both your public-private partnerships as well as your um, constituent base is huge. I have a superintendent's advisory cabinet that prior to the pandemic, we met um, quarterly. When the pandemic hit, we met weekly. Uh, as well as the principal's advisory cabinet. We listen to our students, bringing them in and their experiences. So communication, bringing forward every resource that you have and making sure you build that relationship out so that it goes into the future in whatever work that you're doing. That's great. Great advice, Dr. Okulia. Well, I think you're still muted. Dr. There you go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so, you're still muted is the phrase of 2021. So yeah. uh, don't worry. It's very on brand for us right now. So um, really and truly, you know, uh, as we continue to move forward and we're looking towards how we might spend the funding that we're getting, you know, uh, it's really important to carve out some of that funding for teachers and for teacher professional learning. Um, you know, you can even within the same district, if the if the money isn't there for some teachers versus other teachers, you'll still have equity issues. And so, you know, um, because teachers, you know, they want to do for their kids, obviously, they went into the profession, you know, but the bottom line is, without help understanding how to best use the things that are being given to them, there's no way for them to leverage that to make the learning continue to happen. And, you know, we it's not just the pandemic. It's, you know, if if there's a wet, inclement weather or if there's a, a, a problem within the building for whatever reason, a boiler goes out or something, learning still needs to happen. And teachers can't leverage technology if they don't know how to use it. And so we really need to keep making sure that those dollars are available to help with training for the teachers. Love that. Uh, it's going to come to an audience question. It's a good launching point. But uh, before we get to that, uh, Arnie, I want to go to you. What do you what What are you seeing? What do you have? What have you seen that's worked in Indiana? But also, what do you think is needed going forward? Well, Jess, actually, I was getting ready to unmute. I saw a comment come across there saying that uh, teachers uh, can't use the, um, the technology if they do not know how to use it. That is true at the education uh, um, teacher level, but it, it, it's more, more so incumbent upon us to craft programs that can train out the general public. Um, I, I've heard I've at a uh, seminar uh, all day today, and I've heard over and over, if we, if we send those devices home with the students, and it's the first time a device has ever been in, in that home, how, how does that home know how to use it? Uh, I remember back to the good old days watching my uncle uh, show my 75 year old grandmother how to use a mouse in, on a computer and, and to move her hand horizontally on the table while the mouse moved vertically on the computer screen. Think of, think of that now as, and then we, we have the language barrier on top of that too. So how do we train up on this technology from a language standpoint? So understanding what the real need is locally um, is it connectivity? Is it price? Is it, is it lack of knowledge on how to use? And, and that can be done through mapping and surveys and we can have a whole nother uh, a, a webinar on that. Um, but one of the things I keep hitting on over and over and someone mentioned just a, a speaker or two ago, coming from a trusted source, the trusted local source, um, I don't think any of us would be surprised in the statement to say people overall don't trust government. So they don't trust people that work in government. Uh, as a general statement. So that trusted local source to get the word out into the community that help is available. And then how do we uh, react to that uh, call to action? Great, it's such an important, you're, you're so right too. Uh, you know, when we talk about implementation uh, and the importance of implementing these funds, these federal funds, it really does, it happens at the speed of trust. And, uh, and that's gonna be a tension in our polarized world right now and in the polarization that is here in Washington, D.C. And so it really is gonna be, how do we quickly shift as much of this as we can? It's something all three of you have said, which is community, community-based organizations, leaders that have the respect and trust, uh, that's gonna be vital. And I, I think folks that are, pull together those community coalitions now are gonna be the best poised uh, to secure some of this new funding that's coming down the pike here too. Uh, I want to go, this builds up, Dr. Coley, something that you had mentioned, and it is a question that came in too. 
which the question is so far, uh, what much of the emphasis on the digital divide has been pro providing access to broadband. Um, but what do you do in terms of uh, students who have limited access to technical resources at home and lack key digital literacy skills? And mm -hmm. this is in the context of students, but I, I want to broaden that to be just family members. Yes. Um, that, and so how do we help policymakers, community members understand the urgency and importance of digital literacy? Uh, one thing I will say is that the digital equity grants that are part of um, the infrastructure bill that was just signed into law this week, really makes an emphasis on this digital literacy aspect of it. It, it, it. It's silent sort of the strategies that's gonna be up I think for states and for communities to come up with that. But I'd love for anyone on this panel to talk a little bit about digital literacy and how do we, how do, we do that? Yeah, so um, one of the things that really is um, a, a, not a new thing, but is happening in many, many districts is the, uh, the use of tech coaches and the tech coaches, uh, they work with teachers, but a lot of times they also work with students. Uh, and during the pandemic, many, many of the tech coaches worked with families in the community and they created, in, you know, uh, little pieces of video or instructional sets so that the teachers could send those home and then parents could actually then know how to use the things that were being sent home or how to leverage those things. The whole idea that, you know, uh, we've got people who need to understand how to use technology because in the end, they still have to help the students at home. Even if we, you know, uh, create all kinds of things or send home all kinds of things, if they can't get help at home, then we might as well have not done it. And so that's the reason why we need to make sure that those uh, people who are at the intersection are available to make sure that everybody has a little piece of that whole uh, ability to learn and, and grow in terms of understanding how to use technology. That's great. Any other thoughts from our other panelists? Yeah, I, I dropped into the chat. Um, our Public Education Foundation helped uh, school districts build capacities within uh, faith-based communities, uh, with the local unions, um, you know, culinary, um, all of those uh, uh, constituents that, that support other constituents. And so uh, uh, spinning up professional support for them and then making sure, right, again, knocking on doors, reaching family, we have to make sure that the information is, is in the language, right? We're meeting our constituents where they're at. And so making sure that the resources are in multiple languages as well um, was critical to success. That's great. Ernie, anything from you? Any thoughts on the digital literacy aspect? When I first came out to the Indiana Broadband Office, um, I, I wouldn't even have known what digital literacy is. So uh, under, understanding um, the gap that exists out there, but that communication piece is so important. So uh, ha having having your business leaders that, that may be engaged in one small, tiny sector of the, of the local economy, uh, but playing a, a very large part of it from a monetary standpoint, uh, being a driver to that um, digital literacy and the adoption uh, of pieces. And many of them may have some, some workforce uh, members um, with language barrier issues. So, so working again, uh, as was mentioned with those public private partnerships mm -hmm. is key. That's great. I, I wanna build, I, something that Superintendent Eber said uh, in the chat window here about uh, bringing up telemedicine and we encourage all of our families to use the devices for supporting that. And I, I'd love for, for y'all to unpack that a little bit more because I, I'll be honest, like over the last couple of months, this is one area I've been really excited about is the idea that once a device of connectivity is at home, you could do all these other wraparound services. And we just, we just had the American Academy of Pediatrics declare a national emergency with student mental health. And the problem is like 70% of our counties have no child psychologists. And the only way we're gonna scale uh, services and providers is through telemedicine. And I, I'd love for, for y'all to sort of talk a little bit about what you're seeing that excites you in telemedicine and how that might be a, a really compelling use case here for, for some of this digital divide. I'll do, uh, so, especially in rural Nevada, there are families that um, in order to receive support, say they need to take one child into the doctor and they, and they have multiple children in school. So they'd have to go into town, right? Which is two hours away. They'd have to take their children out if they don't have daycare 
all of those things to be able to travel to the doctor. Now, um, we've really been capitalizing off of these devices. It, it keeps the families at home, it keeps the kids in school, um, and those resources have just, have just been important. So uh, we also put in uh, using the federal dollars uh, for 100 additional staff members for uh, mental health supports. Um, because of what you just mentioned. So the federal dollars have been a huge plus and, and making sure that we um, use these resources efficiently, effectively for what our families need. Great, maybe uh, we're almost at the top of the hour. Uh, and as we were saying at the beginning, Zoom fatigue is real. So like, I know we, we still have uh, over a hundred people that are joining us. In a uh, hundred people that are super interested in it, have learned so much over this last 45 minutes about how to close the di digital divide. Um, I just want to go a, a quick whip around and just sort of and have each of you say like the, for the community groups and the state leaders that are on the call today, what is one thing that they should start doing now uh, in order to begin closing the digital divide, wherever that divide is in their communities right now, what is the one thing that they should start uh, the moment we hang up on this Zoom. And let's start, we'll, we'll go with my sort of Brady Bunch screen. So we'll go uh, with Superintendent Ebert first, and Dr. Akulia, and then we'll end with Ernie. Understanding your data. You can't go with a solid ask unless you know what you're asking for. So making sure you have an understanding of what your need is, and that way you can easily pull in and communicate uh, uh, how the supports that are needed. That's a great, I mean, so, so important. And also something folks can start doing now is that surveying and data collection. Don't wait for the feds to begin sending you out the, the data, the, the, their applications. Start that now so you're ready to do the strategic planning when, uh, when the, the federal applications become available. Dr. Kulia, let's go with you. Yeah, so the, uh, again, with the data collection, um, one of the things that you could need to know is what you have. You know, um, to understand that there's money coming um, and to know what the need is, but then also know what you have so that you can know what the gap is. You know, uh, you can't do strategic things until you know what the gap is. So I would say, you know, again, data collection. All right, data. We have two, two votes for data. Great. All right, well, well, what's your what's your task for this group? I could get off easy and say they took mine, but no, I, I came up with a. <laughs> Uh, 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 something else that we're looking at in Indiana, and, and it's the opposite of sending devices home. It's the bringing the individuals to to the device or the location. So some sort of a downtown technology hub. Uh, any of us that have grown up in uh, small rural communities know that there's empty vacant building after empty vacant building. So if we could turn some of those vacant buildings into a technology hub uh, to provide uh, multiple resources, uh, that can be job skills and training resources, that can be providing uh, uh, technical assistance. Um, that can be providing private cubicles or small rooms to do telehealth uh, doctor's appointments. And then uh, having the locals at the table with that. And the locals could uh, do some sort of a local match that was more of an in-kind thing where they, what they bring to the table is the staffing, the maintenance, and the, uh, the upkeep um, of those buildings. So we're looking at Indiana of, of trying to scale up a workforce, uh, 3D computer, uh, 3D printers uh, in vacant buildings uh, downtown, bringing the community to the downtown to make the other businesses flourish, uh, along with that uh, opposite side of the spectrum of the take-home devices. That's great. Yeah, I love that principle too. Of looking, I mean, community assets could also be what's not being used, and how do you turn that into a community asset? I know that from some work I was doing in opportunity zones and economic mobility and uh, uh, economic development. And so it's not just mapping in the data of where you have access, but also where can you create points of access? Great charge. Well, I we're at the top of the hour. Uh, you all have been amazing, both in the work you've been leading over this last year, the work you're going to be leading uh, in the weeks and months and years ahead. And so thank you for the gift of your time and insight and just lessons learned. Uh, and Cheryl, we'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you, panelists and John, for moderating this great discussion. I know I've learned a lot, uh, and the Hunt Institute is actually working on drafting a policy brief on the digital divide as part of our COVID constituency work, which you can find on the 
the web page here on the slide. So I'm taking the lessons learned here and adding them into our digital divide brief. And I will give credit where credit is due, that's for sure. Um, so thank you again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on a future Hunt Institute webinar. We have a lot coming up uh, in December. We have an exciting conversation with North Dakota's student cabinet. We will actually have students and the superintendent talking about her advisory committee on uh, getting student voice and state leadership. And we also have a wonderful session with DigiLearn coming up to talk about micro-credentials for teachers. So we have a lot of interesting conversations. You can always go to the Hunt Institute website to see what's coming uh, forward in the future. So again, thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you again soon.